It's this so good conference to have, will now be recorded. It's so good to have everyone here on the call. Um, I'm Claudia Holland, Chief of the Bureau of Library Development in the Division of Library and Information Services. It's great to have you here. Thanks for making the time. Uh, this is the third in a series of online open discussions that we're having actually for you uh, so that you can share your ideas, your concerns, plans, frustrations, successes, whatever you would like uh, with each other. Um, I'd like to mention just a few housekeeping things, uh, items before we get started. Uh, we've muted everyone at this point, but we'll unmute you once the discussion begins. Please mute yourself until you're ready to talk. Chat's available and we'll be monitoring it for questions uh, you'd like to pose to the group if you choose that format. We'd love it if you would talk and also share your webcam uh, with us if you would like. If you do get dropped or are having bandwidth issues, please turn off your webcam until you want to speak. And of course you can talk without the webcam, but it's nice to see each other. So uh, please consider doing that. Uh, the session will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel for you and any, anyone who's unable to join us today. So let's get started. I'm just going to throw a question out there as a sort of a tickler, but if whatever direction we take is certainly up to you. Um, this is really your, your discussion. Uh, depending on where you're located in the state, your library may be in phase one or phase two. What steps are you taking to welcome patrons back into your library? And I realize that for some academic libraries, you may not actually be opening up. Uh, I'm not sure what the status of that is for you in particular, so feel free to talk about that as well. So again, what steps are you taking to welcome patrons back into your library? Morning, I'll mention a few things if you like. Great, hi uh, Karen. Hi, um, we've been open since uh, what, May 21st. We're open Monday through Friday, nine to five. Normally we're open during the summer, six days a week and in the evenings. So we started up slow. We're only allowing 40 people into the building at a time. They're checked in, they have, they're recommended to have masks. Everyone's done that. We have computers accessible for people, um, six foot socially distance, no browsing, um, and most people have come in just to get their books. So we did curbside initially. Now we're really being, we call ourselves concierge librarians where we're going into the stack. So um, most of the time they put holds on, but other um, than that, we'll wait, we'll you know get their items for them. They rather like it. Um, we haven't had any trouble. We do have a cop at the door because we uh, just wanted to make sure to deter any kind of um, tr trouble we may have, but we've been very lucky. My concern is phase two. So we're in Palm Beach County, so we're, we don't have to enter phase two, but I'm not sure what I would do in phase two. Or uh -huh. So I was wondering what other libraries have done in phase two that we may be able to borrow. So Karen, you're asking what what are others doing uh, in phase two that may be useful to you and your library? Uh, do others have ideas on what they're doing? Are, are you already in phase two? Hi, this is uh, Amy Jones from the Australia Library System. Hi, Amy. 
Okay. Um, we uh, actually uh, are in phase two and we have uh, been in that uh, since May 8th, actually. We went right into it very quickly. Um, yeah, we had had the plan to offer curbside service, uh, you know, sort of during an interim phase up until uh, June, but we went right into uh, offering library services. So we are offering curbside and personal shopping and library services kind of all simultaneously. Um, and that's actually been working out really well because there's, we've never reached capacity. We did, um, uh, first started off with 25% and then went to 50% pretty quickly of what we uh, counted as hard seating in the building as opposed to occupancy. We did hard seating. And so we were somewhere, you know, in this uh, range between 20 something all the way up to 60 something people in the building at any given time was allowed, but we've never even reached maybe half of our occupancy since uh, we've reopened. And we just sort of chalked that up to people are just not quite either ready to come back or because we haven't started doing in-person programming and we haven't, we don't have meeting rooms open. So some of the drivers of what people wanted to come to the library for, you know, are not there. So we, we considered, uh, you know, we just, um, we started doing curbside and then I think there's a lot of people who are more comfortable with that type of library service, um, just not quite ready to get out into the public yet. But we're looking at the possibility, um, of maybe in-person program, not in-person program, excuse me, in-person meetings, uh, maybe small uh, number occupancy in the meeting rooms uh, as a possibility, maybe appointment-based or reservation-based uh, programming for adult programming. That's probably our next, next thing we're looking at is meeting rooms and possibly reservation-based programming. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Do others have ideas they would like to share on uh, phase two openings? Well, I, I, I would like to ask if, if anybody in the group wanted to speak about whether they have actually, um, in the time that they have been open, have they have any kind of capacity issues or have they had the same kind of issues we've had, which is we've never quite, the, the demand is not there necessarily. You know, we've not had people banging down the doors to come back into the library. And I was sort of curious, is that unique to Osceola County or has that been the experiences of any of the other libraries that have been open? Amy, are you allowing browsing? We are. We started um, with uh, no, you know, we started thinking we were going to allow browsing, but then there were some people who sort of said, are you sure about that? And we were like, no, we're not sure about that. So we blocked off the collection. And then we were like that for, um, we had, you know, phased, we had two libraries open on May 8th, and then the rest of the libraries open May 15th. So those two libraries were kind of the guinea pigs. And we just, we tried the personal shopping, you know, we tried the sort of mediated experience, but what that ended up doing is actually put us with the patrons close up to them more, which was at the time sort of a little bit counterintuitive versus, you know, if we allowed them to browse the stacks, the amount of time that they're in the library actually was kind of reduced and the, uh, the interaction with the collection really just posed you know, minimal risk. So by the time that the next set of libraries opened on May 15th, we um, had browsing. So we've, we've been allowing browsing, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the Osceola Library System in uh, Kissimmee, um, Osceola County. So Amy, do you have any uh... Uh, sort of procedure put in place if people are browsing and touching all sorts of library materials or you figure you're 
is good enough not to have to deal with that. That's my yeah. concern. Yeah, no, we've not been quarantining uh, materials that have been, uh, you know, the patrons have interacted with just for brief periods of time. We tried to, I, you know, kind of try to follow the the science and and sort of the, um, you know, learn about sort of the super spreader events and and things like that. You know, sort of, you know, the things that pose the greatest risk, which was more about the masks, which we do require people to wear in the libraries. And um, you know the cleaning supplies, wiping the computers, things that have prolonged expo exposure. Um, we didn't really feel like the amount of exposure that was happening in the stacks really posed the the same amount of risk to you know against not letting people browse. So, oh, um, I they were asking about programs. Um, I, you know that's just our. We're just starting to sort of think about that, and and um, some of the things have been some of the things we've had to do have not been based on what we wanted to do per se in terms of our time frame. Have been more, you know, we of course had a phase reopening plan, and like I said, it was curbside was going to be sort of the thing we were going to do until we reopened. So if we do start programming again, I, I can't see it happening any sooner than the end of summer reading and the beginning of the school year, um, but. You know the, the county commission could you know or, or somebody in the county could could want something sooner than that so we're kind of prepared uh, uh trying to be prepared now for um you know what's our kind of desires and then what's the desires of the of the county so but personally i couldn't see it doing i would rather get through summer reading and then you know start and make a clean start possibly september 1st Hi again. Are you doing virtual um, summer reading programs with external presenters or are you keeping it to your staff presenting programs virtually if you are at all? We have, we're doing both. We have a couple uh, people who had been scheduled as in person who converted to um, virtual. So I think we have two or three of those for adults and, and children's and then the uh, rest of it is all virtual. I have a quick question about meeting spaces. So are you uh, sort of allowing people to, or would you allow people to self-police on that? I mean, or are you, um, you know, limiting and checking on how many people are in the meeting room? How, how are you handling that exactly? Uh, well, Osceola County, yeah, we're not doing the meeting rooms quite yet, but I think when we did, we would just do lower, well, I'll take that back. We are allowing census, the census um, staff to meet, mm -hmm. and of course, we'll have voting, um, and part of that is 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 self-policing. You know, we'll, we'll set limitations on the space, but in terms of what they do within the space, um, that, that'll be kind of up to um, patron choice, you know. Yeah. Any other comments about phase two opening that you'd like to share? Okay, how how um, how's your la library managing any potential or even current shortage of supplies? Uh, disinfecting supplies, PPE, what, whatever the case may be. Uh, are you facing that? Um, uh, you know, are, are, how are your staff handling that? If the staff who were there, you know, your colleagues? Hi, this is Blake at Rollins College. Um, hi, we, Blake. Hi, how are you all doing? Hi. Yeah. Um, we have been, uh, we are 
for, you know, we're, we have some shortages that we're dealing with, but we are also fortunate that our chemistry department has been home brewing hand sanitizer for the last three or four months. And so they've been working around the clock doing that. And so our hope is we'll have enough for some of the public areas with all their efforts by the time we reopen. Nice to have a chemistry department. <laughs> Just very briefly, we've had um, challenges with some supplies, but we've just been very, um, you know, sort of like terriers. We found other ways. So there's a local supplier of, I think it was hand sanitizers in Boca. Normally we'd go to a larger, you know, um, vendor, but if we can find them anywhere, we do. We just picked up some more at Ace Hardware today. So we're just sort of got our, um, you know, our eyes and ears open for everything. We had face shields when we opened, we had masks, we had gloves, we made our own solution to clean off computers, bleach and water. Um, so we're improvising and then just keep looking for the supplies as we go along. So far, so good. Great. We do have a question in the chat. Gretchen asks, do any of the libraries attending require masks of the public? My county library is only requesting this at this time. We're just re strongly recommending, but what's interesting is the city government just opened today and they're requiring. So we were told we were only allowed to do strongly recommend. Now they're requiring, so I might change the language. So lots of people are saying that uh, it is required. Um, so uh, my question is, how how do you handle that? You know, when someone comes in and you know they forget their mask or they're not, you know, how do you handle that? We have ones we give them. We say we really, you know, we're looking after you by us wearing the mask. Could you please help us out? We've had no problems with that. So we have some right at the desk when they come in. Great. And and are all libraries that are requiring, are you, are you also supplying masks? Robert and Pasco here. We have a limited hey, supply that we um, provide to patrons. So we have some of the disposables and some cloth ones that uh, staff members made. And overall, there's been no issues with patrons. Maybe one or two like don't wanna do it or if they have some medical condition where they can't, then you know exceptions are made or maybe we can do curbside or something like that, You know, depending on what they need. Mm -hmm. Great, so it sounds like you're being very flexible, which is important. Um, I saw there was a comment earlier about programming. Uh, let me see if I can find that again. Um, uh, Gretchen said that uh, she has high hopes of beginning minimal in-person programs with limited attendance also when school starts up in the middle of August. So are people looking at, you know, sort of around school starting periods of trying to, to um, do some uh, live programming, live in-person programming. Yeah, I think that's the goal is hopefully in the fall, like we're able to as well do some in-person stuff, maybe limited like registration or small groups so we're not overwhelmed, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? 
we'll probably do the same in the fall, start with very small groups, um, social distance and see how it goes. Um, I'm not sure yet. We're gonna, we may open our study rooms too before the end of summer reading if it's just a one-on-one -on -one situation and we can clean the room after they're in there. Mm -hmm. so we have people who need assistance with um, uh, food stamps and things like that. So it's sort of like a moral quandary. Do we let them in to help them and then hurt them? Or yeah. playing with that sort of this week. Interesting, yeah. Renata says that she's told her staff uh, not to think about programming until January of 2021. Um, so it does look like it's sort of, you know, in response to uh, perhaps what your, your, uh, um, your authority is telling you, you know, your governmental authority is telling you, or um, it may be, you know, something that your your library can make a decision about, I think. Um, so uh, it's kind of all over the place. Okay, uh, how, how are you, how is your library planning and preparing for the response to hurricane season? as if things weren't hard enough. <laughs> I think the same way we would in any other year. You know, we have an emergency plan. It was approved by the city. Um, you know, we do the very same things we do. Hopefully that won't happen <laughs> on top of everything else but I'm not sure there's anything new we can really do uh, mm -hmm. that uh, emergency. You know, I'm, I don't think there'd be any other way of doing what we've always done. Maybe others would, would think so and they could weigh in. Hi, it's Christy from the Lighthouse Point Library. Hi, um, hey, um, one thing we're looking at is changing. We've always waited till a hurricane uh, uh, warning and the, we, they're talking about doing a hurricane watch when we would shut down so that we could social distance staff while they're they're getting the building ready and getting everything ready um, but that has not been approved yet thanks Renee Renee's put up a, um, a, uh, an announcement from FEMA. Gretchen has asked, um, when school begins in the fall, how would others handle uh, handle it if a tutor wanted to come into the library and tutor two or three children at a time? And that's probably true at academic libraries too, if you're open. Um, I'd probably just, if you have study rooms, I'd see if they wanted to book a study room or something like that. And you can just wipe it down after. Um, they're in a small isolated group, I assume. The parents are consenting them being with that person. <laughs> I am not sure at this time how our... Okay, we lost you, Blake. Yeah, that was my cat was rubbing her face against the monitor and it <laughs> the microphone. Okay. Um, we, I am not sure at this time how our tutoring and writing center uh, is going to provide service. Uh, they've been doing a lot remotely and that's been working well, but we have had in the past about 2,000 people a day in the library and we're going to have to limit somehow the number of people that are hanging around in the library for long periods of time. So I don't know what's going to happen. Okay.
any other ideas on uh, you know uh, how you're going to handle hurricane season? Because I, I think there has been some talk about um, sheltering in place uh, more and more. I don't know whether you know what each county is doing. Um, have you had any news like that come from your governmental agencies? Um, I know a lot of libraries and uh, librarians and staff throughout the um, state uh, man uh, shelters. Um, how is that going to affect your staff who are your staff who are uh, uh, working in shelters? Yeah, uh, Renee says there's a great concern about general popu population sheltering. Renee, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Oh, her mic isn't working. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Renee. I was going to call on you to, 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 does anyone else have any input on uh, what they're hearing or what they're uh, um, doing in preparation? Um, I'd like to know what challenges you you are facing at work that you didn't expect. You know, uh, so what challenges have you faced that you didn't expect? Are you talking now back in the building or are you talking when we were, uh, well, I'll talk uh, back to any, so back any the building. So here's our big challenge and I suspect it's everyone's challenge. So, you know, you pivot to a virtual world and you're, you know, you're expected to do that very quickly with very little expertise or experience. So you do that and you're going along well enough. And then uh, now you're back in the building, boom. And um, so you're basically, you have your feet in two worlds, the virtual and the not virtual, the face-to-face. -face. So we're trying to run summer reading as most other libraries are, I'm sure, where we are going to experiment with doing virtual programming, having no idea if it will work because if summer camps aren't in, um, a lot of other organizations that we would go and do community outreach are not there or they haven't figured out how they're coming back and it's already June 8th. So we're, you know, we're going to take a stab at it. We're going to reduce our programs as far as our performances to about 50%, but we're not even sure if anyone is going to be listening on the other side. I mean, we're going to reach out to these people, but that, you know, you have that sort of put it out there, get the emails out, do the newsletter, do the social media, and then, oh, well, we'll see what happens. So that's big concern this summer. Thanks, Karen. Hi, it's Chris Egan from uh, Lighthouse Point, and I see a, cup, a couple of people on the chat said this too. Um, we are in a situation where some people are have been gone this whole time on administrative leave, and others actually have been working in the building uh, to support 
uh, our takeout service. And I think the people that have been working the whole time may eat the people who, <laughs> who have been on administrative <laughs> leave. <laughs> um, because it's a very, it's a very unusual mindset. I, we have people that are saying, oh, I'm so glad to be back out in the world. It was so boring. And other people who are going, <laughs> were saying, I had came in every day. So it's a very tense working relationship. <laughs> yeah. So how are y'all working through that? We're being recorded, so I can't answer liquor. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, we've had to talk about it. We've had I've had many meetings with different people and we've had to really talk through it because neither side has a good has a good side or a bad side. So it's been yeah. interesting. <laughs> so what other challenges have you faced? Uh, others who are in, uh, in the group um, that you weren't expecting. Uh, so, Amy, I, I see you said we aren't in our building, so staff are on reserve. One of the challenges I wasn't expecting was how hard it was to get them to respond. You mean you mean your your staff or your colleagues, or can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, the vari variability also in um, how people respond to COVID. I, I, I see that you're saying this too, Renee. Um, yeah, uh, how do you reconcile the sort of the juxtaposition between one camp that says, you know, I'm not coming in, I'm not doing, you know, I'm not gonna be around anybody, whatever, and then the other camp who's like, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take risks more and um, and and see you know what happens that's hard uh, yeah and Amy saying that several of her staff have actively assisted with um, city events but where are the other departments so that's sort of the same thing that that we've been talking about is you've got people who, are staying in the building and others who you haven't seen in a couple of months. And yeah, how do you how do you reconcile that? Digital divide too, yeah. I had people on staff on CERC who are lovely and are really connected to the community, but they really had no um, digital skills. So other than just being able to use our computer catalog, COHA, to basically, um, you know, CERC a, a book or put in patron information, that's as far as they'd gone. And then they were told they now had to do lists on COHA, they had to listen to webinars, they had to come up with plans and it was a total cultural shock to them. Mm -hmm. They resented it, but I decided we had to do this. And I'm hoping they continue that interest in that level of wanting to learn more um, as we move forward, because I think it's necessary. So I'm leaving them alone a little bit right now, but I do pop down and say, I hope you're doing a webinar or I'll send them something, but it has been a, a complete change for them. And, you know, are older, less digitally, you know, adept. Uh, it took them a while. They did well while they were home. Now we'll see if they've just decided to forget that. Now we're back. 
Yes, uh, that's a good point. I think is how how are we going to encourage each other to um, for those who are having digital um, challenges? Um, how do we continue that training and sort of um, encourage people to to maintain uh, a level of knowledge that's that's essential if something like this were to happen again? And Jan, you say you hear one day and the next day it changes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Hi, this is Jan Henderson. I'm at Northwest Florida State College. It's actually because we would, um, because because communication was kind of happening hierarchical by the time it got to my supervisor and she told me and I started to plan for that change well the next day the change happened <laughs> so it we we were always playing a little bit of catch up on some uh -huh. of those kinds of things I, I mean some of that is understandable mm -hmm. but some of it was just taking longer you know the executive council would decide on Monday and it wouldn't make it to you know the supervisors until Wednesday and they wouldn't tell us until Thursday and Friday it was different because they decided on Monday to make that change and so there were several things that we were caught doing <laughs> just off the seat of our pants because we couldn't we we didn't know in advance uh -huh. and it was just the difficulty of communication because we were in different places yeah yeah Anyone else want to elaborate on the communication challenges that, that we've all had during this time? I mean, it's nice to have some options, but as, as we just mentioned, people are uh, in different places in terms of being comfortable with technology or, um, or even, you know, trying it. And of course, it's not just the technology, it's just how do you respond as an individual to a pandemic, right? So some days I was not really that uh, productive. I just couldn't be. I was floored by what was going on, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of you have felt that way and so of your staff. So it's not something you can really manage your schedule, right? I call it was yeah. like herding virtual cats. And then I had to think about it and say, well, Maybe they're just having a bad day. Maybe something's going on in their family. Maybe I should let up a little bit and get back to them later and see what's going on. You know, maybe I should listen to them more. Mm -hmm. Are people using phones? <laughs> It's been a little chaotic for us at Rollins, you know. They, uh, it's just, it's just been a little, little crazy, and you know, they've been, they, you know, they haven't, uh, you know, we lost 15% of our our staff, you know, for the whole college, and uh, you know, so there was just, it wasn't clear for quite a bit of time what was going to happen. Um, we all knew that Rollins had had been hit pretty hard financially, but we weren't sure exactly what was going to happen, but uh, uh, overall the administration has done a good job of shepherding us through this, uh, through this whole thing. This is Jan again. Because we were nervous about just um, email and telephone you know because we don't all have each other's home or cell phone numbers necessarily because we also have we're in a learning commons and so we have all the tutors and so because we didn't necessarily have everyone's um cell phone numbers we um we started we we added in an additional communication we used slack actually we started with microsoft teams and didn't like it so we went to slack as a 
a texting mechanism or you know chat communication and what I found was that because I was answering the phones for the whole library all of our public lines we had transferred to my home or to my cell and so I was dealing with lots of phones emails um, text messages because the people that did have my phone number were texting me and slack I was you know I was like please put me in a room where no one can communicate with me for half an hour <laughs> Wow so over communication was your problem huh Jan <laughs> Yes, and you know, it was different different groups communicating different ways. So I, you know, it was it was hard to cut one or the other off because I, you know, it was the different group that was communicating predominantly in each one of those ways. So I kind of had to keep up with all of them. I'm I'm much happier to be in an environment where at least some of the conversation with staff is going on in person now. Mm -hmm. Renee has uh, brought up um, her concern about uh, mental health of um, staff and of colleagues. Um, uh, that's a real challenge, I, I think, um, because especially if you can't see your colleagues um, and you're only uh, communicating via email or text and you, you can't see them. Uh, have others had concerns about your your colleagues and how are you handling that yourself? Um, this is Jan. I forgot about one other communication that was Zoom. Oh, <laughs> and, yeah. and we and um, we used Zoom predominantly so that we could see each other every now and then. Is there something that you have learned during this experience, this this time, um, that you think would be helpful for others to know? It could be something that you've learned personally uh, about, you know, work or just the way you've handled this period, or um, something, you know, a, a specific incident. <laughs> Cutting each other slack. Agreed. I think one of our concerns here in the division is how, how we can help y'all. What can we do to help you? Uh, we're always very concerned about that and, and we, we want you to, to know that we're here and that we want to help you in any way we possibly can. I think just having a forum like this regularly would help. Okay. I really That's appreciate good. this. You know, we can't all get up to Tallahassee. We're still in a changing time, a really, you know, uh, devastating time. It'd be wonderful to do this, I don't know, once a month, whatever. But to be able to talk to people across the state and find out what they're doing and how they're faring is invaluable. Great, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Amy, I don't have that kind of uh, ex expertise uh, to provide a vaccine, but. Um, <laughs> If 
buying in bulk. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, there are a couple of things. Um, Kathy Maloney, are you on? Um, I wanted to just take a moment um, to give her a chance to talk to you about something that we I'm are here. doing. Great. Hey, Kathy. Hi. Um, we're excited about that. We want to just share. Um, Kathy, you want to talk about Flinchair? We, um, sure, sure. Um, as, as many of you probably know, we have been working for a while on developing a new statewide resource sharing platform. Um, this morning, an email went out, and hopefully most of all of you got it, um, announcing that we have finally signed a contract with Autographics. So we are working right now on getting the new platform in place. And the platform's name is going to be Flynn Share It. And as the name, name implies, it's tied to your membership in Flynn. Um, and the division is covering the cost of the platform. So we would love to have any of you, all of you participate in it. Um, we're working on the application right now. And as soon as we have that ready, we're going to be sending it out. So are there any questions? No. Yeah, okay. we're very excited well, about it. Um, actually, someone said, uh, let's see, I don't know. Robert, were you talking about e emailing the information about Flynn Share It? Yeah, I don't think I'm on your mailing list. How do you get on that? <laughs> I I can do that. Um, let me write your, write your name down real quick, and I'll send that out this morning. Thank you. Um, and we will, of course, be having more information coming out. The division update is um, uh, June the 23rd, and Amy and uh, we'll be talking more about this. Um, Amy Johnson, our division director and state librarian. Um, and uh, we also have some exciting information, too, about the CARES Act funding. Uh, Marion, are you on? Yes, I am. Would you like to give us an update on that, please? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, the CARES Act funding, uh, we are working busily on trying to finalize all of our uh, documents, announcements, etc. Uh, we have received a little over $1.9 million from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We will be um, calling for grants for, for these funds. Um, the, we do know that the grants will be a maximum of $25,000. They are open to all uh, eligible library organizations. Our guidelines will be coming out uh, very shortly. We are anticipating our timeline right now, and this has been very fluid like everyone's been saying today. Um, we should be announcing the application availability period about July 1, with, uh, with the applications being due the end of July. Um, with a State Library Council meeting in early September to make recommendations to the Secretary of State and then awarding the grants shortly thereafter. Um, the grants would be available to expend funds through September 30, 2021. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, one thing I did leave off from that, the $25,000 maximum grants will not require any matching funds. Um, and that's about as much as I have right now. Uh, any specific questions that I can maybe answer? Thank you, Marion. Okay. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, and I'd like to be sure that I've given everyone an opportunity to bring up a topic that is just your, your, we haven't discussed that you are aching 
<laughs> to share with us. Um, any sp specific successes, anything that you um, are either feeling frustrated about or, ex or excited about? Uh, Amy is asking, are people posting their reopening plans online? Um, you can certainly share that on the Florida Lib, FL Lib uh, listserv if you would like. Thanks, Robert. Anyone else? Uh, I really appreciate your joining us today. I'm gonna give you, uh, let me see, about um, nine minutes back in your day. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the recording will be available, including the chat on our uh, YouTube channel, BLD's YouTube channel. Uh, we hope to see you again. Uh, and for more discussion about what's happening in the next two weeks um, on June 22nd at, again, at 10 o'clock Eastern. Until then, everyone, please be safe, stay healthy, and let us know what we can do other than the vaccine. <laughs> Thanks to everyone.